Good morning. Happy Sunday. Isn't that awesome? We get to sing God's praises. I'll tell you what, today, by the way, is the third anniversary of having Jason on staff being part of my team. Came up in my Facebook memories, so I shared that. I love those memories. That was awesome. You know it's awesome for two reasons. One, when you walk in and the front rows are so full, you don't have a seat. That's cool. That makes a pastor happy. And then when you get, you don't even wait for the last song to start tearing up and losing it. And my contact's about to pop off my eyeballs. But that third song, what was that? Uh, Unto Your Name? My new favorite. It is. It's just my favorite. I love it. Awesome. Last week, I was fired up to launch our new series called Strange Things. And apparently you were too because the feedback has been phenomenal. We looked at some really strange and bizarre stuff. Some of the supernatural things that happened around the crucifixion, both before and just after. Things we might have read a hundred times, but we never dove into and explored and said, man, that is just weird. But it's so cool and so powerful, and it's in there for a reason. Today, we're going to look at something even more strange. Last week, we left it on a very poignant note, very powerful, where we looked at the scriptures, and it taught us how to acquire the fire, how to have burning hearts like the disciples, right? Like those two that were on the road to Emmaus. How do you have that holy heartburn? And we asked some very probing, very deep, tough questions that we should ask as disciples, as followers. Today gets a little more weird. Let me have my helpers come on up here. We're going to do something a little different today. This is a classic example of a strange story that is just crying out for more insight, for deeper study. This is so bizarre what happens today. So I wanted to show you just a little bit and set the stage for what we're talking about. Thank you, my lovely ladies, my assistants here. What has happened is there is a huge party that has been thrown. And things are going along just fine if you're one of the revelers and you're having your party time. But unfortunately for them, it is short-lived. And what happens is truly frightening. It's almost like the lights dim and you can hear a holy hush in the room. And a some call it the very first original ghost story, happens right before their eyes. A disembodied, floating, ghostly hand begins to show up and write strange and cryptic, bizarre messages right there on the wall in front of everybody. This is no small party. This isn't just a little soiree. This is over a thousand nobles and concubines and evil people practicing debauchery right there in public in this great hall. And this ghostly hand shows up and it begins to strike fear into the hearts of everybody who's there. So much so that scripture records even the men grew pale. The king himself, his knees started to shake and give way. And what happened on that wall was so frightening, so terrifying, that it changed the course of an entire nation. And what showed up on this wall were some very interesting and frightening words. So strange, so cryptic that people didn't even know how to interpret them. As they looked at this wall, the king called for his astrologers and all of his greatest and brightest to come and try to decipher it. And no one could. In fact, all they were left with were strange words like mine, mine, tackle, parsi. Pause for dramatic effect. But before it gets creepy, it gets happy. So what we're going to do is I'm going to take you back in history. I'm going to take you to Babylon, to this amazing city, and I'm going to paint this beautiful picture of how this city truly had it all going. And you might, just might, see some parallels, not just with us, but with the world in general today. So open your Bibles to Daniel chapter 5. Hold your place there. Don't look at it yet, but Daniel chapter 5. I'm going to read from the NLT today if you're using your Bible app. While you pull that up, let me welcome our online campus. Great to have you with us each and every week. And if you're a first-time guest, a special welcome to you. Thank you for checking us out. We pray God's Word will speak clearly and directly to you today. Daniel chapter 5 sets this beautiful scene of a thriving and a powerful city, the city mighty Babylon. Babylon was a very pagan and very proud city. It was so ingenious that they actually built this city with the mighty Euphrates River flowing straight through it. 
and they harnessed the power of this thousands of years before we even thought to do these kind of things. It was such an amazing city, so powerful. This watered all the groves and the orchards and the farmlands, and this city got up to over a million people. One million people in this city. And it was so above and advanced beyond any other city in that time. It was the pinnacle of city life. It was the highlight. You might even say it was the peak of good living. You might, in fact, we even have the rare signs that show, there it is, welcome to Babylon. The pe- oh, wait, no, that's Apex. But, and I'm not slamming Apex. No, no correlation. Don't go out here saying that. Mayor Olive, if you're watching, this is not about you. I promise this is, this is just to show you we still do this today. We take pride in our cities. And I can't imagine what they had coming in as you walked into Babylon. It was breathtaking. It was powerful. It was important, and everybody knew it even the king. In fact, he took great pride in this city. So much so that it would eventually become not only his downfall, but his successor, Belshazzar. In this city, there were the most impressive gardens built. Probably the most impressive were the hanging gardens. In fact, this was so incredible, it is still to this day listed in the seven wonders of the ancient world. That's how impressive it was. And the king had these beautiful terraces made, And he would walk along them, and they were pumping in water from the Euphrates to keep this irrigation and all this lush vegetation going, these earth-filled terraces. This This next one shows his pride and joy with to walk among these. And he would just gaze out from his castle terrace and just drink in the pride. And he would sit there and bask in the glory and say, look what I have built. And he took such great pride in it. This city was so well fortified, so dominant in its day that they began to take on the false identity that they were indeed indestructible. That they were actually to the point where they were probably invincible and no one could come at them. Why? Because they had built these walls around it. Walls so impressive. They were 387 feet tall and they were so wide, 80 feet wide, that you could literally race not one, not two, not three, but four horse-drawn chariots along the top of the wall and have races, side by side. That's crazy. That's almost as wide as our worship center. And that was going in each direction 15 miles in each direction, like a square of 60 miles. Now, to put that in perspective, so we grasp the majesty of Babylon. Our nation's capital today, Washington, D.C., is just 10 miles square. 10 by 10 by 10. Now think about that. Babylon was even bigger than our nation's capital, Washington, D.C. That is prestige and honor and power. And it started off okay, and then it just started to go downhill because trouble was brewing, and it was on Babylon's doorstep. When they walked out this night, and they stood across those walls, and they looked out, they saw something different tonight. The Persians and the Medes had brought their armies, and they had encircled all of mighty Babylon. That is a big army that you can look out as far as the eye can see and you see the torches glowing and the armies have come and they have come to lay siege to mighty Babylon, to your city. So Belshazzar, the king now at this time, comes up and he looks out and he says, I've got a 20-year supply of food stored in here. I have the mighty Euphrates River coming through my doorstep. I will outlast it. You can't get me. You can't come over my walls. You can't knock my walls down. Are you kidding? We are in defensible. I mean, invincible. (laughs) Freudian slip, because what he didn't know was there was an ingenious plan hatching right under his nose. So what does Belshazzar do? He does what every good king does, right? He sees the threat, and he says, sound the alarm. Get my master, sergeant of arms. Ring the bell. Women and children, protect them. Put them in the inner citadel. To your arms. Get your swords. Go. We're going to defend this. (laughs) Not only does he not do that, He thumbs his nose at the enemy and says, it's party time. And he throws the most lavish party we've ever seen him throw. And he invites a thousand nobles and a thousand different vassals and lords and all kinds of concubines, which is a polite way of saying prostitutes. And he brings in all these people and he throws an incredible party. And that's where we pick up the story today. Read with me in verse one. So King Belshazzar gave a great feast for a thousand of his nobles, and he drank wine with them. While Belshazzar was drinking the wine, he gave orders to bring in the gold and silver cups that his predecessor, Nebuchadnezzar, had taken, get this, 
from the temple in Jerusalem. He wanted to drink from them with his nobles, his wives, his concubines. So they brought these gold cups taken from the temple, the house of God in Jerusalem, and the king and his nobles and his wives and his concubines all drank from them. And to make it worse, he says, while they drank from them, they praised their false gods, these idols made of gold and silver and bronze and iron and wood and stone. It's temple treasures, holy implements. He raises them, and to make it even more blasphemous, he toasts pagan, demonic idols. Can you imagine? This is breathtaking arrogance on display. This is so much self-pride. He has danger encircling his city at his doorstep, and instead, instead of hearing these alarms, he's clueless, and he parties his troubles away, or so he thinks. And that is the first warning for us, the danger of losing all sense of restraint. He lets loose. He goes all in and indulges every evil urge and desire you could possibly think of, and he thinks he's going to get away with it. You ever known anyone like that? Because they've lived on their past glories or their past dominance, or perhaps because they've gotten away with certain things in the past, they continue to go and they think they'll get away with it forever. That's what this whole city was doing. And it was being led by this wicked king. He fell for the lie that it's what's outside him that makes him strong. He didn't even notice the corruption that was taking place, not only in his own heart, but inside the entire city. And Babylon would soon fall because they were corrupt from the inside out. They had no sense of restraint. Sirens should have been going off long before the army encircled his camp. Long before that, when, when, when morals started crashing around him, I mean, this is, this is great. The warning here to this guy, when we feel most secure in our own strength, when we feel most secure, that is when danger is most near. That is when peril is most imminent. When you take pride in your own flesh, when you think you have arrived and you have nothing to fear, this drunken feast had no restraint, no limits, and little did this wicked king know he was actually celebrating his funeral. Within minutes, something horrible was about to happen. When we get to the point that these Babylonians did in this culture, where they give over to an anything-goes society, where there is no limit to your gluttony, there is no limit to your materialism, to your sexual permissiveness, where any kind of perversion you can think of is not only encouraged, but is accepted and embraced, and they think they're getting away with it. Does that sound at all familiar with any nations today? Think about what they are doing. But unaware to Babylon, guess what's happening outside the city walls? This is so genius. Whoever the military leader was of this, whether it was Cyrus or Darius, or, or they were one and the same because history says they're trying to decide who these two great people were, they're looking at this, and they said, we can't go over those walls, and we can't go through those walls. Guess what they did? They take the mighty Euphrates, and very quietly, they divert it into the marshlands around the city, and that river continues to drop, and as that, hello, and as that, as that river continues to drop, it begins to widen, and you could go under the walls. And they walked in completely unopposed because the gates of the river stopped at the top of the river, and now they could walk in on a dry riverbed, and no one saw it coming. And he's celebrating, toasting, dilly-dilly, everybody have a great time. And his enemy is right under his nose, and he is so clueless. The king never saw it coming. He didn't even realize this moral decay would also imply national decline. Does that sound familiar at all? This is incredible. The Babylonians had lost all sense of restraint, and here's how you know it. When you go to the temple and you take things that are holy from right outside the Holy of Holies, we talked about the curtain being torn, and it's, it's missing in this picture so you can see the Ark of the Covenant, and they take the golden chalices and all the implements, and they say, hey, Forget the true one God of Israel. Let's use these for our own blasphemous thing. And they begin pouring and toasting to prostitutes and saying more wine. And they're having this drunken orgy right there in front of a thousand people. No restraint. And they think they can do this and get away with it, that God is not going. God is serious. And he will deal with anyone, anywhere who desecrates what he calls holy. 
And here's the deal. If God is the same yesterday as he is today and forever, then that means he's still serious about it. Which makes me wonder, is it appropriate for us to ask, what about us when we demonstrate ways that we have lost all restraint? As I was preparing this message, I thought, what would it be like to live in my parents' age when things seem so much more interesting? Or my grandparents. What would it be like if I could take them as a teenager and insert them as a teenager today? Do you think they would be slightly shocked with the anything goes, with the incredible hypersexualization of everything, with the pervasiveness of anything goes, where anything your heart can desire or dream up, your wickedness, wickedness heart can dream up, is at the touch of a fingertip. We allow it into our homes, whether it's TVs or streaming or internet or movies or books to read or goodness, even the print magazines. I'm standing at the checkout line. I've got Marin and Milo, and I'm like, oh, my goodness, covering their eyes. It's like, and guess what? I didn't change. You didn't change. But culture is changing. You ever been at the beach? You stand there and the, just as the waves are lapping up at your feet, and you stand there long enough, you see it erode all around you, and you feel the sand going away, and you just start sinking? It's slow and it's steady. But make no mistake, it's happening. And we see that, and this is such a warning, the graphic permissiveness that we have. Never forget this, church. Hear me. What we have today is a result of what we tolerated yesterday. You have today what you tolerated yesterday. What we winked at and said, ah, oh, that's, that's your business. <laughs> you know, that, maybe that's your truth. That's a lie from the devil. We don't get to make the rules. He established them. If we're a disciple, he says, follow me. Take up your cross. Be a radical disciple. And this is the way to live. This is the way of holiness. Walk in this path until it's inconvenient or it's hard. And then, you know, you can fork right here <laughs> or left or make it up. It's your truth. No! That's a cultural lie, and it comes from the devil. He wants a thousand roads to supposedly lead to your truth. But Jesus showed up and said, Nada, I am the way. I am the truth, and I am the life. And no one gets to the Father except through me. Here's the sobering truth. We will inherit from tomorrow everything you and I are tolerating today. Everything you and I wink at or play footsies with or say, well, it's just, it's just a little sin. Really? That's how it happens. It's a little at a time. We look around and we go, how did we get here? Because nobody woke up today and said, I think I'm going to have six affairs and go do this and kill eight people. Nobody does that. It's little things that we whittle away our foundation. But it's what happens next in this drunken orgy, this debaucherous party that it gets frightening. Look with me at verse 5. Suddenly they saw the fingers of a human hand writing on the plaster of the wall near the king's palace, near his lampstand. The king himself saw the hand as he wrote, and his face turned pale with fright. His knees knocked together in fear, and his legs gave way beneath it. Y'all, that is frightened. Have you ever felt that kind of fear? This guy is terrified. Verse 7, and the king shouted for his enchanters and astrologers, get in here, fortune tellers, come before me. He said to these wise men of Babylon, whoever can read this writing and tell me what it means, I'll give them all these things, right? I will dress him in purple robes of royal honor. They'll have a gold chain placed around his neck. He will become the third highest ruler in the kingdom. Oh, and his astrologers are like, yeah, woo, we got this, but they couldn't. Not one of them could read the writing and tell him what it meant. So the king grew even more alarmed, and his face turned pale. It was already pale. So now we have two times pale. He is double pale, and his nobles at this point are even shaken. Imagine the scene of this party. Now the queen mother, God bless her, somebody with sense, walks in on this, and she whispers to him and says, wait a minute, I vaguely remember your predecessor, King Nebuchadnezzar, kind of had some guy tucked away, and he would come in, and he would interpret all these strange things and these riddles and stuff. Anybody remember his name? Daniel, the name of the book we're reading. They brought in Daniel, so she whispered and said, call for Daniel. He'll tell you what the writing means. Look at verse 13. So Daniel was brought before the king, and the king says, are you Daniel, one of the exiles brought from Judah by my predecessor, King Nebuchadnezzar? 
I have heard that you have the spirit of the gods within you. I love how, how close, but so far. <laughs> the spirit, little s. Gods, little g, multiple, like a pantheon. You have the spirit of the gods within you, and you're filled with insight, understanding, and wisdom. My wise men are idiots. They've tried to read these words on the wall, and they can't do it. Verse 16, but I'm told I can give, you can give interpretations and solve difficult problems. And I love what he does next. Here comes the bribe. If you can read these words and tell me their meaning, you'll be clothed with purple robes of honor. You will have a gold chain placed around your neck and look like a rapper and a rock star. You will become the third highest ruler in the kingdom. So right here we see the next lesson that cries out, the danger of losing all sense of respect. Notice what he does here. The danger of losing all sense of respect. He has no respect for Daniel. He has no respect for all the history from the, the people of God. Nothing is sacred to him anymore. Nothing. They had abandoned every absolute. And they had allowed their restraint to be cast off so they no longer respected anything. Nothing was sacred. When you get to the point where you are taking objects, sacred objects from the holy temple that were within feet of the Most High God, hiding behind that curtain so it wouldn't kill us, he's so glorious, and you drink wine and get drunk and toast them to demonic, pagan... You, I can't think of anything more blasphemous. These guys had no sense of what was sacred. They were in dangerous territory. Now look at their faces in this next picture. Look at this. They had no respect, no holy fear until now. Well, now God has their attention. Now the writing's on the wall. You know that's where we get that phrase, by the way? The writing's on the wall. That means, uh-oh, time's up. There is stuff coming down the pike. Your time is up. One of my study Bibles put it this way. When the fingers showed up, the frivolity was replaced with fear. The fingers turned frivolity to fear. I love that. How genius, capsulating what happens in this moment. But I want to point out something so strange here, something so interesting to me. Notice during this whole drunken soiree where Daniel wasn't. He wasn't at the party. Oh, now it gets real. Why was that? He wasn't invited. Whether he was held in prison, whether he was off prophesying somewhere, Daniel was not invited to that party, and it's very revealing. Relate this to your own life. Most people do not want a godly man or a godly woman around when sin is happening. Most people will reject that. When the wine is flowing and people are trashed and the morals are gone and it is, it is anything goes and wickedness and sin is happening, are they happy when the pastor walks in? <laughs> There's a song, literally, I heard it in college, called Hide the Beer, the Pastor's Here. <laughs> True song. It's by the Swirling Eddies. I barely remember it, but I was like, ooh, man, that's so great. Nobody is having this kind of sinful party and go, you know who's missing? Pastor Matt. Give him a call. You know, those people at Potter's Hand, they would love this. Come on. If you walked in and that was going on, it would be like, Shh, record scratch. Oh. Hold this. <laughs> Look what he's got. What's he doing? Put your clothes back. What is this? You know what I'm saying? And they would suddenly feel horrible. Why is that? Because sin does not like to be in the presence of bright, exposing light. When you turn on the kitchen light, do the roaches come out and go, Woohoo! Bright light! We're so excited! Pew, they go. And that's what we do. Do we like to have our sin? exposed before the world? Not at all. And that is something so amazing. But here's the thing. So, so by the way, young people, teenagers, if you're not getting invited to those kind of lame parties, that's a badge of honor. That means people are respecting your character and your integrity. Keep it up. That kind of stuff is no place for us to go and blend in as if we are just like that. We are called to be separate, to be holy. So hear me encourage you on that. That is awesome. Do not be sad if you are not being invited to that kind of debauchery. Press on. I believe the Lord is happy. But here's the thing. Notice how strange it is when the writing's on the wall, when the crisis comes, they are not looking for their immoral friends or their drinking buddies to interpret that. Who do they call? The one with spiritual discernment. And you probably know this too. In your life, when the rubber hits the road and the crisis comes, guess who they pick up the phone and call? You. Because you have spiritual truth. 
You are a true friend who will give them what God says. So into the hall walks Daniel, and he looks around, and he sees frightened faces, over a thousand people in this great hall. And I bet you could hear a pin drop. I bet when he walks in, that shouting stops, and that drinking stops, and all of that <clears throat> debauchery ceases when he walks in. Can you imagine the strange, eerie silence as he looks over and he sees the holy implements scattered throughout the hall, tables overturned, food everywhere, articles of clothing discarded everywhere, and he sees the holy chalices that the high priest had used, and I could just see him bending over and picking them up. and very reverently setting them back on the table. And inside, you know, there's a holy fire of righteous indignation. Notice he is the only one in the room who's not afraid. Oh. Daniel showed up, and he had a message for him. I love what he does here. This is so just like Daniel. He begins to preach the word. He reminds him of his pride and his power and all of the possessions that have taken over. But Belshazzar hears none of it. And the first thing Belshazzar does is he launches into that bribe. And he promises Daniel all these motivational things. Hey, I'm going to give you stuff, position, power, and all these things. And look what Daniel says. He says, keep your stuff. <laughs> keep it. Give it to somebody else. I don't even want it. Oh, 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 by the way. I will tell you what this means, though. I love this. He's like, you're not getting out of here without this. Like, <laughs> you might want to sit down, because I'm happy to tell you what the word of the Lord is. And Daniel lays it out. I love this. I love his heart. I love that it's always in the right place. He truly couldn't care less for earthly treasures. He's happy to give everything, including his life, to God. David Platt, I was reading an excerpt from his book today, and he put it this way. He said, we will not wish we had made more money or acquired more stuff or lived more comfortably or taken more vacations or watched more Netflix or pursued greater retirement or even been more successful in the eyes of the world. Instead, we will wish on that day that we had given more of ourselves to living for the day when every knee, every tongue, every nation, every tribe will bow before the throne and sing praises to our incredible God. And then he concludes with this. I realize there is never going to be a day when I stand before God and he looks at me and says, I wish you would have kept more for yourself. Wow. I wish you would have kept more for yourself. How about you? Your time, your treasure, your talents, do you keep it all for yourself? Is everything the Lord is blessing with you? Are you a giant bowl that you keep it? Or do you have a funnel tip and you allow some of it to pass through to bless others? Are you a giver? Or are you only a taker? Maybe today is a time to take a step more towards a true disciple and to pass on some of these blessings. It's a challenge for every one of us. Belshazzar missed it. Even his predecessor, Nebuchadnezzar, got it. From time to time, Nebuchadnezzar even had this beautiful thing. He said, those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. Notice that bottom half. Those who walk in pride, he is humble. Even a blind squirrel found an acorn from time to time. The man whose pride led to ruin back and forth so many times. Even his predecessor got it. When we fail to remember where our blessings come from, when we fail to remember to whom we truly belong, guess what? We become puffed up with pride. And that's what was happening. And that's our last lesson from this strange story, the danger of losing all sense of remembrance. When we fail to look back and remember, when we fail to, to see these profound and powerful lessons, pride is often the predecessor to destruction. Write it down and count on it. We see it all the time. Pride comes before the fall. Belshazzar was so arrogant. He was confident in his flesh, and he boasted about himself. Let me put this in modern terms. There's a great movie. I can't remember the name of it. Maybe you will when you see it. But there's just some guy, he, he looks like this, and it's from some, some movie. Anybody remember what this is? Star Wars, of course. All great biblical stories come from Star Wars. Anakin has already fought Count Dooku one time, and let's just say it didn't go well. But guess what? He's back, and he has a confrontation with the great evil Sith, Count Dooku. 
And he pulls his lightsaber and he says, oh, I've been looking forward to this. My powers have doubled since the last time we met Count Dooku. And Count Dooku just grins. He's older now and he's like, I can't believe you just said that. And he grins and he, he has the most beautiful one-liner. It is like a mic drop moment. If he had a mic, he would drop it after that and say, Count Dooku out. He, after, after Anakin comes up and braggadocio says, I have doubled, my powers have doubled since last we met, Count Dooku looks at him and very quietly says this, good, twice the pride, double the fall. What? Count Dooku just became Pastor Dooku in this moment. He got it. Even he knew. He's like, you have set yourself up for a fall because pride always leads to a fall. Whether it's a nation, whether it's a church, whether it's an individual, pride comes before the fall. Just ask Lucifer. Wow. That's what started all of this. Those who walk in pride, he is able to put down. So, Pastor, are you ever going to tell us what those strange words mean? Yes, but you have to come back next week. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Look at verse 25. Let's find out what they mean. This is the message that was written. Mine, mine, tekel parse. This is what those words mean. Let's look at them one at a time. Mine. Mine means numbered. God has numbered your days of your reign and has brought it to an end. This is from the Aramaic word meaning numbered. That means your number's up, your time's run out, there are no more chances, the opportunities for you to get right in your second, in your third, in your fifth, in your 800th chance are done. Time is up. Right now, even though you're partying away your night, mine. Look at verse 27. Tekel. This means weighed. You have been weighed on the balances like a scale and have not measured up. The word picture here is literally God's scale of righteousness. And he's over here with his standards, and we are on the other side. And voom, <laughs> we have been found slightly light in our load. And we don't measure. Of course we don't measure up against God's holy righteousness. That's why we needed a Savior, so that he can impart his righteousness to cover ours. Because on our best day, I wouldn't want people to judge my self-worth and my eternal life on that. There is filthy rags, all our good works. It's his righteousness. Who wants to be measured on that? Look at verse 28. Parson. This means divided. Your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Wow. And that's what this literally happened. It means to break into pieces. And that's what happened to his kingdom. And the Lord, he's done this before. He separates the sheep from the goats. He separates the wheat from the tares. <laughs> Nobody's laughing at the party now. Mine, mine, tekel. Man, that is not what I wanted to hear in this moment. You know why? Because it was too late. Time was up, and no one's laughing. Numbered, weighed, divided. Now comes your judgment. So Daniel chapter 5 ends with this simple verse. Look at this. That very night, Belshazzar was slain, and Darius the Mede received the kingdom that very night. Don't miss this. The mighty Babylon, the greatest city of the ancient world, is relegated to a destruction summary of just two verses. And they're done. How humbling is that? Mighty Babylon parties no more because their enemies diverted the Euphrates River and they snuck in under the gate unopposed. Not a shot was even needed to be fired, and they're there. You know why? Here's the truth of it all. You can't outrun God's judgment. Not one of us. There will be no walls high enough when we stand before him. There is no walls thick enough to prevent man or nation from eventually being weighed on the scales of God's justice. That's the beautiful part of Jesus. There is a last night for every nation and for every individual. So in light of eternity, let me ask us this. Do you want to be weighed and found wanting without Christ? Should we not sense the urgency now, today, while there's still time to exchange our unrighteousness for Christ's righteousness? To say, I want that. I'm with him. That's what the Messiah came and brought when he died on the cross. I just read this great story of a chicken and a pig who were walking down the street one day. A chicken and a pig. And as they walked down the street, they came to the front of a grocery store with a giant sign that said, we need your help. Bacon and eggs desperately needed. 
Well, the chicken looked at the pig and said, I got an idea. I'll give him some eggs if you give him some bacon. Well, the pig thought about that. And he says, uh, no. <laughs> the chicken said, why not? It seems fair enough. And he says, I'll tell you why. Because for you, it's a contribution. For me, it's my life. And when we read the scriptures and we see what Jesus says, even to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross. We have too many people in this world, especially even in our churches, who are willing to give God an egg here or there. But when the call comes to surrender everything, they're nowhere to be found. They're happy to point to somebody else. <laughs> you can be the giver. <laughs> I'll be the taker. Look at their faces one last time. Burn this image into your mind. Notice the fear. Notice the panic, the terror, the pale faces, the knees knocking together. Notice it on everyone except one person, Daniel. Daniel is the only one in that room who has perfect peace. He is the only one. There's no fright. There's no panic. There's no fear. He boldly tells them what is going to happen. And he does it with a complete holy countenance. He knew exactly whose hand that was writing those words. And he knew him intimately. That was the Lord. And so here is the good news for every one of us to take with us. The day of judgment holds no fear for those, like Daniel, who know the living God. That changes everything. If you've accepted Christ's righteousness, have you? Where would you be if you were weighed on the scale right now? Would it be dependent on your own works? That's a dangerous place to be. Don't do that. Let it be what Jesus has done. He is weighing us today. Let us not be found wanting. Pray with me. God, I thank you for the power of your word, how it's so applicable to today. Not only to our own life, but to our own nation, our own world. We see so many people thinking they can get away with things left and right and that you will never hold us to account. I thank you that you are a God of judgment and a God of love, that you provided a way so we don't have to weigh ourselves on your scale. The law shows us that we cannot measure up, and that's why, Jesus, we worship you. You wrote yourself into the story. You provided a way. You were the blameless sacrifice. You gave us a chance. Any who would accept that, you would impart your righteousness to us. Lord, we accept that today. God, if there's somebody here today who hasn't, I pray that you would tug on their hearts in this moment, and they would surrender to you. They would pick up their own spiritual cross and follow you and declare you Lord. Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place. God, we intercede for those who don't know you, family members, friends, co-workers. We lay their names before your throne now. Lord, would you soften their hearts? Give us as bold, like Daniel, those invitations and those, those, those divine appointments where we can be bold for you. Thank you for being with us today. In Jesus' name, amen.